Hello, BookTube. I thought I'd give you an, an extra tedious book haul because it occurred to me the other day that I very seldom tell you about the books I get at my beloved Brattle Bookshop here in Boston. I go every day. I almost never walk out empty-handed, but those uh, those books never show up <laughs> on this channel. And that's not right. They're a big they're a big part. They're they're the sauce that seasons the main courses that I get every day in the mail. Uh, so I wanted to show you my last batch, especially since it illustrates a couple of axioms about the Brattle. Uh, the first one is go with the flow of the Brattle sale carts out in the sale lot. It's a, a totally variegated thing. It's not organized in any way except by price. Uh, so you never know what you're going to find. The carts are refreshed all the time. Uh, and over the years, over the decades, it's been my experience that if you go with what you find, that's much more satisfying than going to the lot and saying, well, you know, I need a copy of the Scarlet Letter. That never works. Uh, and when you do that, when you go with the flow often enough, you start to become sensitive to the flow. <laughs> and uh, the first batch of books here that I got were that. First one is... Uh, Adam at Memento Mori's beloved Annie Dillard. This is a little book of hers called Living by Fiction, uh, which is just a, a bunch of meditations of hers on the reading and writing life. One of my favorite books of hers. Uh, and it's this lovely little paperback, so I got it. And then uh, mere moments later, I found this, Pioneers and Caretakers by Louis Auchincloss. It's a collection of literary studies of his of uh, nine American female writers. Uh, and he's wonderful at that. I always thought when he was, uh, during the 150 years of his writing career, I always thought that he showed more interest in what he was doing and more uh, insight when he was writing nonfiction than when he was writing his endless, endless short stories set in New York. Uh, and his novels set in New York, they they seem to turn most of them on one well-burnished anecdote and one very high-class moment, and they... <clears throat> I don't know. I always I always liked his nonfiction better. And a, a couple of these essays, this is on Sarah Orne Jewett, uh, Edith Wharton, who, about whom he wrote a whole book that's wonderful, uh, Ellen Glasgow, Willa Cather, Elizabeth Maddox Roberts, Catherine Ann Porter, Jean Stafford, Carson McCullers, and Mary McCarthy. Now, I have never read an essay by Lewis Auchincloss on Mary McCarthy. That will be a joy. Uh, so, and, and it's along the same themes of bookish type things. And then the third one in that theme is the mother of them all. This is volume one of the collected, annotated essays of Virginia Woolf. Uh, which is just, this is, these are from uh, 1908, I think. Uh, 1904 to 1912. So these were years in which she was doing, you know, 350 word jobber things for money. These were these were before she became the monstrous Virginia Woolf who would get a commission from the TLS to review a new book and a year later claim she was still working on it. Now everything that came out of those uh, bullcrap excuses was brilliant. But still, you don't like bullcrap excuses, <laughs> no matter what. Uh, and these are just, it's just endless. There's probably a hundred book reviews in here. Uh, books that are long since gone. These are not the essays that will ever be reprinted in, in a big anthology of hers. They have, they have to belong in a project like this. Uh, <clears throat> and not only is this a great continu continuation of the bookish theme that, that I hit at the Brattle, uh, but also... Another rule of thumb at the Brattle is that if you see something like this, Volume 1 of the Annotated Essays of Virginia Woolf, chances are you will see the other volumes in the series come to the sale lot. It's very seldom that someone will sell just one book in a series like that. They'll sell it all. But, and then they get boxed up. They get taken back to the Brattle from wherever they're sold. They get put in the basement of the Brattle, which is just a rabbit warren of books. They get mixed in. <clears throat> and then eventually, a month later or a year later, they get priced and put out on the sale lot. So they will all show up there eventually. And <laughs> so, I'm not that I I would have bought this anyway because these this period of of Wolf's productivity is of special interest to me. Uh, but 
now I know to keep an eye out for volumes two, three, and four in this series. Uh, so that was that was neat. That was a nice little theme of uh, of bookish books. Uh, and another theme that I noticed uh, the other day when I got these books was World War Two, which is right up Steve's alley. Uh, I only got I confront I controlled myself. I only got two books from that theme because I really don't need. 18 books on the Battle of El Amin. <laughs> uh, I got this. This is by Sidney Astor. It's called 1939, The Making of the Second World War. Uh, this is a, about uh, the Munich meetings and the, the, the tense dialogues between Neville Chamberlain and, and Hitler about Hitler's aggression on the continent. And there is our uh, douchebag author <laughs> in, in his douchebag author photo. Uh, I have read many, many books on on that are set basically entirely in 1939, but I've never read this one. I don't know why, <laughs> but I never have. So I got it right away. And then there's this. We move from 1939 to 1941. This is The Deadly Embrace. Uh, it's by Anthony Reed and David Fisher, and it's about the, the Nazi-Soviet pact. Uh, the, the pact between Hitler and Stalin. With, and the back, instead of talking about the book, has a quote from Adolf Hitler from Mein Kampf. You do not make pacts with anyone whose sole aim is the destruction of his partner. And then a quote from Joseph Stalin. I know what Hitler's up to. He thinks he's outsmarted me, but actually it is I who have outsmarted him. And then the bottom quote is also from Mein Kampf. An alliance with Russia is a blueprint for the next war whose outcome will be the end of Germany. <laughs> so so there you go Hitler was in prophetic mode when he wrote that uh, but again I have never read this book but I have read many books on the, the Nazi Soviet pact so this will be of endless fascination to me it's, it's, it's one of the joys of reading history is that when you get to know a particular subject really well every new book is like visiting your high school graduating class it's you're going to you're going to be fascinated or frustrated but you're going to know your ground which is a great feeling this is why uh i always tell people who who ask me you know i'd like to read more history how do i begin uh i always advise that approach that approach actually works find something that you're interested in particularly something small that you're interested in not so much the life of mary queen of scots as say you know uh one particular aspect of the life of Mary Queen of Scots and read about that aspect until you know it really well until you know it backwards and forwards and then branch out from there exfoliate from there uh, I, I strongly advise that as a way to get into history because history can be intimidating and the way you disarm the intimidation factor is to know what, what you're reading so for instance uh, the Munich Agreement between Neville Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler there have been many books on that subject not only small ones that start out as a general introduction, but in-depth analyses of them. So if you're interested in World War II history and you don't know where to start, start with something like that. Start with one battle, or one meeting, or one person, and learn about them, and move on from there. It's an approach that actually works. Uh, and then there were two miscellaneous items that I got this time around. First one is uh, Everyday Life in Ancient Times. Uh, which is a 1951 National Geographic book. I love National Geographic books. They don't really make them like this anymore with the with the uh, independently commissioned artwork and the, the chatty independently commissioned columns. Uh, I have quite a few of them. I, there, are, there are one or two National Geographic books that I don't have. Uh, this one is a gem. Uh, not only does it have all of these... Uh, color illustrations of what life was like this particular one is uh the painting of a, a planting of an olive tree there are all kinds of things in here uh all kinds of uh, you've got uh black and white photos and uh which is national geographic always specializes in and you've also got these dorky full color uh paintings and the articles are by names you'll know. There are two articles in here by the great Edith, Edith Hamilton. Uh, so this is ancient times, this is ancient Meso Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. And, and I just love it. It's catnip. Uh, and then the, the last thing that we'll do for this extra tedious book haul was, was this, Scoundrel Time by Lillian Hellman. This is her, her long-awaited memoir. She'd been talking about it forever. It's a tiny thing, so, you know, it didn't take much work. It just took 
uh, putting away the bourbon for an afternoon. <laughs> uh, and uh, it will be the first thing in this that I that I read because I haven't read it in ages. I haven't read it in decades. Uh, and I remember, I have fond memories of it. I remember it being really good, really catty, really smart. Uh, and I, God only knows what what holes in my original reading of it I have since filled without even knowing it. So I will meet Lillian Hellman not only on uh, more level ground intellectually, but also much closer to her own age, <laughs> which helps a lot. So uh, that'll probably be the first thing in this that I read, other than uh, all of the... I mean, this is what I do for a living now, is write book reviews. So this is... And Virginia Woolf is our queen. No one's ever done it better than her. So uh, it'll be... It, this will be probably first, but followed by Scoundrel Time. Uh, and there you go. That's a Brattle book haul for you. Uh, <laughs> sorry if it's of no interest. Uh, let me know and I maybe won't do it again. <laughs> but I spent so much time there, it felt only natural. Thank you, BookTube.